Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 32nd episode of In the Trenches, Kroll's Weekly Cyber Threat Intelligence Briefing. Today is January 8th, 2024. So today's a cool day. Uh, today is actually National Clean Off Your Desk Day. It's the official day to rescue your workspace from all the clutches of chaos. Uh, no matter where your desk is, sometimes it's in an office, sometimes it's the kitchen, and sometimes even the bathroom, depending on who you are. Uh, let's tidy that tornado of papers and unleash your inner desk ninja. Uh, let's all be desk ninjas today to transform all our productivity into the source of being great. So in today's brief, we'll be covering the most recent trends that our threat intelligence team is witnessing in the trenches. My name is Keith Wojcik, Global Head of Threat Intelligence. This week, we're joined by Senior Vice President and Shadow Ninja, Galactic George Glass, Vice President and Joni Ninja, Midnight Magic, Mikesh Nagar, Vice President and Chuni Ninja, Red Blade Ryan Hicks from our Cyber Threat Intel team. So let's talk news you can use for January 8th, 2024. So NIST released advisory on speed of AI development. Uh, adversaries can deliberately confuse or even poison artificial intelligence AI systems uh, to make them malfunction. And really there's no foolproof defense that the developers can employ. Uh, computer scientists from NIST uh, and their collaborators identify these vulnerabilities of AI and machine learning in a new publication, which you can see the link uh, to visit for more information. Uh, three new malicious Python packages are identified. Uh, these three new malicious packages have been discovered in the Python uh, package or PyPy open source repository, the capabilities to deploy a cryptocurrency miner on effective Linux devices. Uh, the malicious packages are modular seven, drift me and kept me again. Take a look at the link we provided. Uh, for more information. Well, lockpick bit 3.0 is added again. Uh, they have targeted a healthcare organization, you know, extracting data without encrypting any information. I guess that's a hooray for them, but obviously not really. Uh, despite these actions, the group maintains the, ass the, the assertion that they are attacking in a benign manner by refraining from encrypting data that could interfere with patient care. God bless them, you know, so the nice of them, so nice of them to take that into account as they commit all this series of illegal activity. So today, what are we doing today? We're going to be following the trends our team is concentrating on. Uh, the continuation of the steel malware and Google, uh, Apache off-biz vulnerability, when SXS binaries, uh, Word docs delivering not only good resume, but NIM-based NIM, uh, NIM based malware. So today, uh, George, you know, as we continue to watch the development of information steel and malware operations, uh, continue to exploit the, uh, the, authentic the authentication cookies from Google, can you provide us with what you're seeing in the trenches and what the users need to understand and steps to protect themselves? So George, I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely, thanks Keith. Uh, yeah, we've been following the um, the Steeler malware community very closely. Um, we, we put out some reporting in um, November um, following some uh, some activity around Luma Stealer. Uh, Luma Stealer um, is, is essentially a fork of Vidar Stealer, um, and they are designed to uh, take information uh, from especially web browsers. Um, it seems that during during that time, since November till um, at least last week, um, the developers of Luma Stealer have likely purchased the, uh, the capability um, I'm, uh, I'm not going to call it a vulnerability anymore uh, after uh, some information we received today, um, but the capability to um, extract um, OAuth tokens um, from the multi login endpoint um, in Chrome browsers. Now, the multi login endpoint um, is uh, designed for, for syncing Google accounts across devices, so multiple machines, um, phones, um, you know, what, what have you. Um, what's interesting about this particular endpoint um, is the sessions captured in that way um, apparently can persist um, across password resets, um, and I'll go into the details of how to remediate that um, in just a second. Um, but this follows reporting from CloudSec and Hudson Rock, um, who first identified um, that the uh, the threat actor called Prisma um, was selling the exploit in October 2023. Um, and it seems, you know, obviously Luma Steeler has uh, since uh, purchased that exploit and incorporated it into their code base. Um, and as is kind of traditional in the, uh, the information stealer uh, community, um, lots of other stealers, again, many of these based on, on Vidar Stealer uh, itself, um, 
have incorporated that capability as well. So still see Radamanthus, uh, Medusa, uh, Rise Pro, Pro and White Snake um, have all uh, developed that capability so they can steal those tokens as well. So what to do uh, in terms of remediating this threat? Uh, well, um, just just today um, we uh, we saw there was a, a, an update to the story. Uh, Google have apparently replied uh, to uh, inquiries that Bleeping Computer made, um, which essentially indicate that that endpoint is working as intended. This isn't a vulnerability, and um, you know the, the capability to, to extract information from the endpoint is actually. Um, you know, necessary. Um, and what you can see on the screen there is a, um, a screenshot uh, that, that CloudSec took of uh, the decryption of that um, code, uh, that that token um, from Luma Steeler logs. Um, and what they're doing here is essentially encrypting that uh, to, to send it out. Um, that makes detection of that uh, particular token um, leaving the environment very difficult, um, but we maintain that you know we, we've got pretty good detection for for the Steeler malware itself, um, executing, running, um, and a lot of the other behavior that it does. Um, and so, in terms of remediation, um, what do we do about that password reset? Um, well, essentially, uh, according to Google, um, the way to mitigate that is to uh, log out of all the devices, um, especially the one that is impacted uh, by the malware itself, um, and then go to the Google devices um, web page um, as part of the Google account, um, and then from there uh, invalidate all of the, the access tokens uh, that are there. So there's a button there to log out of particular devices. You need to log out of all of those devices that are impacted um, I would recommend just logging out of everything just in case. Um, and according to Google, that will um, invalidate that token um, and allow you to then change the password um, because the token is now no longer valid. Um, yeah, we're going to keep a very close eye on these um, throughout the year. Um, but with that, I will pass it back to you, Keith. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Appreciate that. Mikesh. Oh, man, the Apache Zero Day. Offbiz ERP allows any attacker to access sensitive information and really remotely execute code against application using the ERP framework, um, you know, which obviously is never a good thing. Can you let us know what you're seeing and how this will affect us in the future? Sure thing, Keith. So, uh, Sonic Wall uh, recently discovered a fun, well, a critical vulnerability within Apache Office. Uh, for those who aren't aware of what Apache Office is used for, it's pretty much an open source uh, ERP, ERP system, which is enterprise resource planning system. Uh, although it may seem very unfamiliar, there is a large software supply chain where it's used uh, as part of a wide install base in a lot of prominent software. Now, this vulnerability has a potential to circumvent authentication protection using as a significant security risk. The vulnerability uh, has been tracked at CVE 2023-51467. Now, uh, as mentioned uh, just a moment ago, the vulnerability is located within the login functionality of uh, this system uh, and arises from an incomplete patch intended to address a previous critical vulnerability uh, tracked as CVE 2023-49070. Uh, this had a CVS score of 9.8, which was released back in December 13 of 23. Now, uh, the vulnerability CVE 2023-51467 is exploited by utilizing either an empty or invalid username and password parameter in an HTTP request. Uh, Effectively, this manipulation triggers an authentication success message, thereby evading the protection measures and uh, granting unauthorized access to internal resources. Uh, there have been many reports of proof of concept exploits uh, out in the wild identifying and using this vulnerability, so it's only a matter of time for uh, malicious actors to add this uh, in as part of their uh, tools of uh, part of the arsenal of tools that they use. What we do recommend is uh, for any applications or developing companies that are currently out there that uses Apache Office within their product to uh, 
uh, to update immediately to version 18.12.11 or later as uh, uh, versions uh, from this and later aren't affected by the vulnerability. Uh, as always, we do uh, recommend that all organizations conduct uh, thorough security testing before deploying patches to ensure their effectiveness. Uh, employ network segmentation and access control to limit the impact of potential intrusions, as well as monitoring network traffic for anomalous patterns in, uh, indicative of uh, server side request forgery or unauthorized access uh, taking place or potentially taking place within the environment. Uh, that's all from me, Keith. Back over to you. Thank you very much, Makesh. I appreciate that. Ryan, you're going to brief us on a couple topics here. First, you know, a, a DLL search order hijacking method allows the adversaries to load and execute malicious code and applications within Windows, you know, especially in the Win SX, SXS folder. Um, first, you know, what are you seeing that you can tell us that's going on with the threat actor technique and what, what's going on there? Secondly, you're going, you're going to brief us on something else, um, which is a new phishing campaign, again, using a word, the Microsoft Word, here we go, uh, using a word to bait victims and to deliver a backdoor. Uh, can you let us know what's happening uh, on that flow to exploit the victim's computer and kind of the end result? So let's first talk about the DLL, DLL search order. Ryan? Yeah, thanks, Keith. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so firstly, with the um, talking about sort of DLL search order hijacking, um, so researchers uh, published their insights into kind of a new uh, variant of that technique that that we that we already know, um, but specifically targeting um, vulnerable binaries in the Windows uh, SXS uh, folder, um, and that really just reduces some complexities for a threat actor uh, for that technique um, due to being able to um, execute uh, the vulnerable binary from within the uh, WinSXS folder itself uh, without needing to move uh, that binary into a act controlled folder. Uh, and there's also no requirement uh, to kind of bring in uh, additional and um, potentially noisy binaries uh, into the environment. Um, the DLL uh, search order hijacking itself kind of works by uh, targeting binaries that don't explicitly state the full path of DLLs um, that are loaded by the binary. Uh, and that when the, the binaries run, it essentially causes uh, that binary to search through a series of, of locations um, to find the correct DLL uh, by name. Um, so in this research, uh, the team identified a number of vulnerable binaries uh, that exist within the uh, WinSXS folder. Uh, and a full list of those um, is linked uh, in, in our report um, to, to, to go and have a look at. Um, and the, the new variant of attack is it's fairly straightforward, I guess. Um, it conducted um, those kind of bullet points at the bottom there. So firstly, the, the threat actor creates a folder. Um, obviously post compromise, they'll create a folder uh, where they place the their malicious uh, DLL file and um, names the same as the one that they're looking to mimic. Um, from that creates folder, they then execute a, a vulnerable binary uh, within the um, uh, WinS XS uh, folder um, through a command line tool such as uh, command.exe or, or PowerShell. And then due to the search order process, uh, the malicious DLL that they've placed in that folder uh, in that current working directory is loaded um, by that that executable and then that's what you see on the, the image on the right there um, and ngen task uh, exe was the the vulnerable binary uh, spawned by by powershell uh, and then you see right at the bottom right of the image uh, there uh, is the um, malicious dll uh, loaded from um it's, it's named not a system folder just to show that it's it's a, it's a user folder it's loaded loaded into that um looted loaded um uh, into that uh, binary. And in this case, it was a reverse shell, which was part of the uh, proof of concept uh, that was uh, spawned. If we just go on to the, the next slide, please, just to looking at the just a few kind of detection opportunities, I guess, here. Uh, so, um, firstly, we we do have uh, existing uh, coverage against uh, DLL search order hijacking, uh, quite a few uh, detections surrounding that technique. Of course, it's, it's relatively uh, old at this point, um, and we're also implementing new uh, detections and updating existing the, to capture activity surrounding uh, the highlighted sort of variations with this uh, new research. And I've just listed there the kind of uh, a few additional behaviors that are recommended to either kind of monitor or, or hunt against um, 
again, depending on the the environment that uh, is, is being uh, looked at here, um, this may suggest malicious behaviour. Of course, some of them may may have legitimate activity surrounding these detections. But again, it's just all around kind of looking at behaviours and and not identifying potentially suspicious activity. Uh, so here we have um, kind of looking for binaries contained within that particular folder. Loading modules uh, from non-system folders uh, may may suggest. Um, malicious activity, uh, unusual processes invoking uh, binaries within that folder, uh, and also um, binaries within the folder, again, spawning suspicious um, child processes. So again, very varied depending on the, the actual environment, but just a kind of a few ideas uh, kind of surrounding um, this particular uh, technique. Uh, and next, if we go to the kind of next slide, just a kind of a quick uh, look at uh, a recent phishing campaign. Um, so phishing campaign was uh, identified uh, employing uh, Microsoft Word documents uh, as a disguise uh, to distribute uh, a currently unnamed uh, backdoor uh, written in the NIM uh, programming language. Uh, NIM-based malware, uh, although it's kind of previously fairly uncommon, uh, has been gaining traction in recent years uh, as a relatively um, Rare programming language, um, and it's actually reported uh, in, in some areas um, to to circumvent uh, Mark of the Web, which is kind of interesting uh, point there. Uh, the unique aspect of NIM uh, as, as a programming language is its uh, static typing and cross compilation uh, features, and that essentially means that the attackers can write a single malware variant uh, that can be cross compiled uh, against a number of uh, platforms. So potentially uh, writing a single malware variant and, and then being able to use it across uh, a number of operating systems uh, in one go. Uh, and then the, the attack that was recently reported, uh, recipients uh, were lured through uh, phishing emails um, with a, a containing a Word document uh, instructing users to, to enable macros um, and leading to the activation of the, the unnamed um, backdoor. And upon execution, um, the, the backdoor checked for uh, presence of analysis tools, kind of your, your typical uh, defense evasion uh, techniques. Um, and it subsequently established connection to the remote server, uh, mimicking uh, a domain uh, similar to uh, the, the laws in the, the phishing email. And there it kind of waited uh, further instructions. Uh, not much additional information really is available at the current uh, time the, on this campaign, but something that we're we're looking to kind of analyze and track a little bit further, particularly surrounding the the reports of the mark of the web circumvention. Circum Convention. Um, again, if that is in, indeed the case uh, surrounding the uh, NIM program language, uh, something that we 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 we'll be looking into, and of course reporting uh, any further findings that we we have on that particular um, analysis. And with that, I'll uh, hand back to Keith. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I uh, really appreciate it. And I'd like to thank everybody that has taken the time to tune in to Kroll's in the Trenches Weekly Threat Intelligence Briefing. We hope you found the session informative. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to contact the team at cti at kroll.com. A special thanks to George, Makesh, and Ryan for all the information today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and release your inner desk ninja. Uh, feel free to email us for ninja names, that those that want them. Just email cti at kroll.com and we'll give you your ninja name today. Thank you, everyone.